I think that I'm going to hide in Somewhere by a gated star Baby, they ain't never gonna find me I'm a renegade oh. I could be the one who saved you from this army We could be as one and we'll escape We could run away, we don't gotta stay I can feel it, it burns inside me Take away the pain, we can go insane I can feel it, it burns inside me We could run away, we don't gotta stay I can feel it, it burns inside me Take away the pain, we can go insane Trust me, I won't let you down you from this place baby they ain't never gonna find me find me find me we can run away we don't gotta stay i can feel it it burns inside me take away the pain we can go insane i can feel it it burns inside me we can run away we don't gotta stay i can feel it it burns inside me take away the pain we can go insane Trust me, I won't let you down Before I'm too invested I should probably ask ya Ask you all my questions Get to know you better Why can you be trusted? Will you take me for granted? And will you let me down? I know I feel it's something for ya
I can have a cup of coffee because I know what I'm in for and you don't. And so I'm going to tell you now a real, real treat. When I told a couple of people this week that I was going to host Kate Normington on Coffee and Connect, the, you should have seen the response. OMG, the queen of musical theater in South Africa, the woman with the spine tingling voice, the zany person. She's a little bit off the wall, you know. I had that comment as well. Deep, philosophical, contemplative, absolutely brilliant, an absolute icon. When I grow up, I want to be her. Cannot imagine the response. Kate, it's such an honor and a pleasure to welcome you to Coffee and Connect with me, Dorian Wheel, Dr. D, today. And I'm just so looking forward to this discussion because you've done so much in your life. You've internalized so much. Clearly, you have so a, a myriad of things to pass on and to teach us. And uh, it's, it's hard to know where to start with this illustrious career of yours. But I guess I want to just welcome you and say hi as a start. And something that's really important that I have to say in the beginning is a new addition to your family. Can you um, hear me, Mary? Can hear you, yes. Yes. Hi. hi. Thank hi. you so much for that uh, completely undeserved introduction. Uh, but I, I hope to live up to it at some point in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> I have a picture of the latest addition to my family. Um, I hope this is acceptable. Uh, she's a small feral kitty um, from uh, Bluebird uh, Shopping Center. Um, she, um, she was a little feral, so she's just kind of getting used to life um, in a domesticated arena. Um, I hope I've done the right thing, but time will tell. I think it takes about two to four weeks to sort of draw them out of themselves. Anyway, that's a side story. That's a, a side one. story, but, you know, as you're talking, I wonder if there's anything sort of reminiscent in a way. I mean, I don't want to look for things that aren't there, so please say no if there isn't. But if yeah. you're adopting a feral cat, which we know is really challenging, Instead of saying, you know, um, I want a cat from a good breeder who's pretty and good looking and who won't give me any trouble. It says something to me, even in that act, about challenges that you take on that aren't easy and about the size of your heart. Can you connect with that? Or, or I, don't, I don't know if it was that as much as an accident because one of the security guards down at um, Bluebird just called me because I'd left him with, with food down there. And, and um, so he, he just called me and said, I've caught her, um, come and get her. So <laughs> I had no choice. He'd, yeah. he'd, he'd actually caught this. I mean, you know what feral kitties are like. They're, they are, um, they're you can't approach them at all. And you've managed to, to get hold of her. So, but she's, yeah. it's, it's amazing how, you know, when they're babies, seven weeks, which is quite far gone for a feral kitty, um, you know, they're still at an age where you can persuade them to come into your arms mm -hmm. and hold them. But it's, apparently you should sort of get them at about the age of two or three weeks and then they're far more malleable. So she, she hisses. We call them her hissy fits. Um, <laughs> well, actor and she kind of being in the theater without wanting to kind of be too derogatory or judgmental. You know, I'm sure that you have both experienced and witnessed hissy fits Ooh. in your life, in your career. Yeah. Oh, but <laughs> but I think I think I think it's a. I was thinking about it before this interview and. And it was something that I'd kind of wanted to chat to you about, I suppose, really, because I think as a youngster, you know, going into the industry, I, I was so, um, you know, I had so many absolute opinions about things and I was hypercritical about myself and others. So I, you know, there, there was, there was a hard edge to, to, to that existence and it, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of live in that space. And after a couple of hard knocks and realizing, you know, that I wasn't the Oracle of Delphi in terms of 
you know, um, opinions, I, I then sort of learned to temper my, you know, my, my approach, because I think I, I had some very hard edges earlier on. But I think a lot of that is defense. And I look at the kids today in the industry, um, and I'm amazed at their largesse and their, um, you know, their generosity, because certainly growing up at the time I did, there was a, you know, a, a huge sense of competition and pr having to prove yourself. And um, I don't think I sort of maneuvered that terribly well, whereas the kids today are far more hail fellow, well met. And there's, there's, I don't know, there's a sort of, um, there's a balance. Mm. I think you, you know said a more of a, an abundance mentality. Mm. Completely. Yeah. You know, maybe, um, maybe, but it's interesting to know whether, I mean, what you're seeing is what is true on the inside or whether there's just such an ethic of that we're in it and we need to really come across like that. Maybe it is. So there's a lot of, no, oh, I mean, sorry. you speak about some hard knocks. I, I want to hear about the experiences that did teach you something and kind of sandpapered some of the sharp edges, but also some of the amazing experiences that you've had that also served to confirm some of the wonderful things that you knew and, and that you knew even more deeply about the theatre and about yourself. But before we do that, I know that Brian Schimmel, who you've worked with for many, many years in the theatre, who is with <laughs> us here in the studio, has certainly assisted in putting something together for us, which reflects this amazing career that you've had. Brian.
Beautiful. My goodness, Brian. And it is, it's, it's fantastic. But I feel I'm afraid I've gone, Dory. I've, I've gone. <laughs> okay, well, I, I know what it does to me when I say that. I mean, there are almost not enough weeks in your life, never mind years, <laughs> to kind of, you know, be joined with all of those roles and live them in the way that you do with such passion. Uh, the diversity from ingenue to rock and roll singer, from vamp to witch to, you know, comedian to, you know, the whole diversity of it. I'm doing this to give you a minute to collect yourself because I feel, um, as, as you are expressing, what does it do to you to sit back and say, OMG, that's really me? Well, I it's funny because as, as I was watching all those images that Brian put together so incredibly beautifully and sensitively, I sort of thought, well, my goodness, you know, we, we <laughs> I, I, I'm quite gobsmacked actually, but I, um, yeah, I, it, it, it brings back obviously incredible memories, but I, um, I, I'm not quite sure where to start. Oh, Dory, I sort of there's a part of me that sort of feels that I I came into this industry inadvertently, and as I often say to Brian, you know, I um, I I sometimes don't feel um, completely qualified to be here, except um, except in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I said in that note that I'd sent you that I, I have a dubious charm that um, uh, managements have seen fit to use on occasion. So until they stop doing that, I shall, um, I shall continue. You know, Kate, you also said that they've never stopped. <clears throat> and uh, yet over all of these years with all these performances, and the memories that they elicit, you know, flashing in front of you. It hasn't, it, nobody has said, okay, you know, we have now, I mean, you, you quote David Niven beautifully in Bring on the Empty Horses, I think it was. Yeah. Did yeah. you ever read that? I, I never read the, the complete thing, but he I talked mean, about that. He speaks about that and, you know, it's kind of, you, you adopt it. A little bit and I wonder if it's kind of reminiscent of a lot of people in the industry where they say instead of being discovered I'm waiting to be found out <laughs> so the duty that you say I mean each one is gee it's there's a sort of oh okay I know that I've got a disarming charm but they really want me and they want me to play this role and night after night you do get standing ovations and yet it seems as if there isn't a complacency. There's still this kind of, of surprise through all these performances that you talk about. Absolutely. And, you know, I think each performer is going to be their, their own worst or best critic, you know, depending on how you look at it. And, um, you know, if, if you are sort of looking at things and being exacting with yourself, being an exact, an exacting bust, and you know it, it's almost necessary. But not everybody is going to like you or enjoy your performances. So I think um, you know what, what you need to, as an as an individual uh, in this industry, what you finally need to come to is that, that you know there will be people who who want to watch you or sort of enjoy certain aspects of your your performance and. Um, you know, and, and I, th I suppose if you're still getting enormous joy from it, I think if it stops being fun, that may be a, a, a sign to kind of bow, bow out. But if you're still impassioned about it and feel committed to, to sort of getting things right, you know, and, and hopefully that the, the hypercritical and the hypervigilant part of yourself can be silenced enough to enjoy it, you know. Well, um, which, which you must do because you've been in it for over 30 years. <laughs> and you enjoy it 
everything just just reflects. I mean, it's funny when you say that. First of all, if you if you look at you, you don't look that much much older than that. You must have started when you were about ten as a child. <laughs> Oh, okay, but I mean, what compelled you in the beginning? Just a bit of the story of what went into it. We've heard something about what's kept you in it a little bit. But you also say things, you know, I've heard you say that being in this industry and acting with these and and interacting rather with these creative, talented, artistic, capricious, crazy, loving you know, diverse people almost like rediscovering another family or almost yeah. like a substitute. How has that been over the years? What do you mean by another family? I think I think when you meet like-minded people um, and you, you find a tribe who sort of resonate in the way that you do, it comes as quite a relief because I think for so long artists who sort of grew up in, in perhaps places where there was um, a war of attrition on, you know, the arts or, um, or anything that was other. So to, to find a, a group of people who, who are like-minded and focused and um, kind of articulate the same dreams, um, it's a relief, you know, to, to, to encounter that. And I think in the early days, um, you know, when I, I first started out at Wits and when I first met Brian, um, Brian Schimmel, um, I, I'd worked with Brian um, at the soundstage with Ian von Memmerty. And my I cut my teeth with Brian Schimmel in a lot of ways um, in this industry. And he was one of my teachers. Um, I think we drove each other nuts. Um, and, um, but there was always a great fondness and uh, uh, um, almost like a shorthand between us. Um, and you, you, you're in an arena where people can read you, you understand them, they, they understand you, especially someone like Ian von Memmerty, I, I have to make mention of this. He was in a, in a lot of ways in this industry. I, I encountered people who kind of grew me up um, and taught me an enormous amount. Um, and were very compassionate to me um, and instructive. So there are two things that are coming through about your kind of analogy of people in the industry and the needs that were being met and that are met through, through engaging with them and a family. In your own family of origin, I think there are two things that you've highlighted. One is to learn something, to be grown up, as you say to be taught, to be challenged, to have an example, almost like you would in ideally in a healthy family, mm. to have wisdom imparted to you by our luminaries that you are acknowledging and talking about. But there's also, I think, something that people really relate to and need, and that is kind of this feeling of being embraced and belonging, like you would in a family, was this true of you and and what was happening in your own life and in your own family? Was there encouragement or were there lots of statements of one day you'll grow up and get a real job? <laughs> no, there was there was never that in my family. Um, I, I grew up with a, a single mom uh, and an older sister. So in a sense, I suppose I, I felt I had um, two parents, two female parents, um, which can be uh, tipped over, uh, kind of overbalanced with, with a, a, a lot of female energy, um, which, which can sometimes uh, be problematic. But having said that, um, my mom was eccentric, <laughs> um, no surprise there. She read ferociously. She loved the arts. Um, so the fact that I went into drama, I suppose, was no surprise. Um, although, you know, we kind of had a bit of a precarious um, life, um, which in some ways I'm grateful for these days because although it does come at a cost on occasion emotionally, I sort of feel the gaps I, I 
I'm also enormously grateful for the humor and love that we shared because we were a little triumvirate, you see. Um, and uh, we could say all sorts of things about each other, but nobody could say them about yeah. each individual. So we sort of survived in this strange and precarious way. And now that I'm older, I understand exactly what it took for my mother to bring up two kids on her own. And I wouldn't recommend it without a lot of help out there. So I have enormous respect for her uh, now. And as I've sometimes said to her, it's a death-defying love I have because we spark each other off and we inspire one another, but we also are very alike and had many battles when I was growing up. But to, that was a long answer to your question, Dori. So there was a lot of love and creativity. You know, you speak about very powerful connections and uh, love that are almost death-defying. You also talk about that when it comes to the arts and to theater and, and especially musical theater. In fact, you do make a statement that says we make art to keep from wanting to die. When I read that, I thought, no, you know, that's a hell of a statement. We make well, I, think art Kurt I don't know what the exact quote is, but... With apology to Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah. In you're saying that there's such a purpose and a drive. I mean, I don't have to say what you're saying. You can say what you're saying. But what I felt when I read that is that there's a compulsion and something on the other side, a beauty and a meaning that comes out of literature particularly and song that reminds us of something to stay alive for on an ongoing basis in, in the work that you do. Completely. Um, and if I think about sort of growing up, um, my God, in this, you know, 65 and then 75, at the age of about nine, my mom, <clears throat> we had, you know, we had one of those, I was going to say gramophone records, but it wasn't a gramophone. It was, you know, the, the, the turn style thingy where the, the record used to drop and oh, you'd have yeah. a cover at the top. Yeah. And... Um, uh, you know, we'd play um, the Four Seasons, Frankie Valley, and Mom used to play Camelot, you know, at death-defying levels on a Sunday morning, fling open the windows, and my sister and I would have to, you know, listen to her singing along with um, Vanessa Redgrave and, and whoever else. So, yeah, those are, those are memories you will never lose, but it reminds you of what made you happy at the time. But it also influences how you sort of move you know, move forward past that. Just another story, Dori, I have to tell you. Once I had I had a, a deaf nanny who was completely deaf, although we sort of tried to um, get one of those implants for her. And my sister and I used to play her Elton John at levels. You know, we'd, we'd try to see, you know, whether she could actually pick up on any of the, the rhythms and... Um, you know, uh, what we, we thought we could try to sort of have her sort of hear something. We'd point the lyrics, and her name was Pauline. I still remember her to this day, but this poor woman had to suffer these two children trying to force Elton John and uh, blood, sweat, and tears down her throat. You know, it was a funny memory. Sure. Yeah, it, 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 it is, and it's funny how those memories kind of stick and, and, and those memories, even little snippets that you think to yourself when you're telling them, you know, what does this really mean to somebody else? But I know that it means a lot to me, you know, that kind of moment. But there have been defining moments, sort of big defining moments in your life that uh, you still remember and other people can connect with things that have made a difference and that perhaps have helped you either expand your realizations about something or make decisions by confirming truth you know that you knew before but uh, can you tell us about one or two of those perhaps a, a very positive one first mm. that made a big difference in your life well i i think 
um, after Sunset Boulevard in London, I'd sort of returned. I'd, I'd been in Sunset Boulevard in two incarnations. On the West End. On the West End. <clears throat> but um, uh, so initially it, it had been Patti Lapone who'd, who'd been in it and I had to come back to Joburg because, you know, we hadn't entered the EU at that point. So I, I had uh, passport problems. But when I went back, um, you know, Sunset Boulevard had also uh, become something other um, and Betty Buckley was performing in it at that point as Norma Desmond. And so I went into it at that point. And then after Betty Buckley, um, <clears throat> there were a couple of reincarnations, I think, after her um, Elaine Page took over and then Petula Clark. But there were a couple of others, but I was in that span and you just throw away these names, you know, like they roll off the tongue. Patty. Oh no! I mean, but I was part of the ensemble, so so we were <laughs> lesser minions. Um, but they were lovely women and very friendly. Um, but you know, we we often didn't really have anything to do with them because you know the, the show would go on and then we'd all sort of disappear into the night. But um, I suppose after Sunset Boulevard, it was quite difficult to find work um, in London. It can be. You can go for ages without, um, you know, being able to get arrested, as they call it. You, you, took, you, you performed in that role? Of not only yes. For, for one yeah. night, I think David yeah. Grinrod from the, the really useful company had, had given me a night to go on and... and Fantastically, the sound guy who was working for us at the time made me a little uh, recording, which Brian Schimmel uh, got me to download. And, you know, I've now got a, a CD on, and I've got a record of it. But if the sound guy hadn't um, made a recording, I would never have, you know, had it. It was incredibly sweet of him to do that. So one hallucinogenic night, I, I played the role. And, um, but it was after that that. It was quite difficult. And then I got into Annie, which turned a, a corner for me in London and worked with the um, the composer and writer of the musical, Martin Charnin, for the 21st anniversary of Annie. And he used to call me, he used to call me Barbara because I used to talk to him like this. And he'd say, Barbara, come on, you know, throw your shoulders back, be confident. Um, you know, I don't want you apologizing coming on. Um, because Grace Farrell, which was the part that I played in, in um, Annie at that point, um, you know, it's got to be very warm and, you know, relatable. You know, she's got to, uh, she's got to uh, charm the young Annie out of Hannigan's clutches. And so she's got to be very, um, you know, friendly and, and engaging. But my, it used to drive Martin mad that I'd be become too apologetic and he'd say, throw your shoulders back. Anyway, <laughs> so after Annie, um, yeah, I, I sort of turned a corner and started getting a bit more work there, but then strangely came back to South Africa to be with um, a, a partner at the time. So after that, you saw, I'm not leaving that, by the way, I heard that, but let's go back to what those West End experiences did. You know, they made you believe they made you see yourself a little bit like other people were seeing you with your head held high and back shoulders. There was seemed like there was a gap before of, of how you were being yourself. And then it was confirmed by really, well, I mean, unbelievably. Uh, no, it's never confirmed, Dory. It's never, never confirmed. confirmed. <laughs> well, no, you hang around me too much. I'll get you believing in yourself every day and saying that you're great. <laughs> <laughs> Funny that you're talking about uh, recording. I mean, just so strange. Take a listen to this. We actually, I think, Mr. Schimmel, oh, maybe he doesn't have the recording. I thought that perhaps he did. But I do know what we do have because it's been something that uh, we actually haven't spoken at all. Maybe we'll cut in and then pick up on the story because I know there's so many other really important moments that that uh, are definitely you are wanting to share and we want to hear about. But before that, I want to talk about uh, 
how you are coping through this time because it's really a challenging time very of course i don't have to say that as um, for the industry the kind of raison d'etre for the industry is the connection with live audiences mm. and, and with applause and that's what energizes you and spurs you to do it on you have to reinvent yourself now people are nervous scared what's going to happen uncertain don't know how it's besides that the huge economic challenges you know many people are oh, that's that's their bread and butter and what they rely mm. on you being so steeped in this all of the time um i wouldn't say reinventing yourself but every now and then the craziest things seem to pop up <laughs> craziest thing i actually just became alerted to them now because i took a look and saw i have i mean this girl is really not only creative but just your you know you say your greatest limitation is your imagination your imagination has no limits and so you've brought in some of that i think maybe to lighten your life and everyone else's uh, at this time now let's take a look at some of that hello darlings it's a long way to tipperary it's a long way to go. And that's probably about as much sense as you'll get from me today. Here are a few more tips on how to keep your brain from turning to mush. <laughs> Speak with authority about subjects you know very little about. Can you tell me what would the correct ignition timing be on a 1955 Bel Air Chevrolet with a 327 cubic inch engine and a four barrel carburetor? It's a bullshit question. Does that mean that you can't answer it? It's a bullshit question. It's impossible to answer. Impossible because you don't know the answer. Nobody could answer that question. Your Honor, I move to disqualify Ms. Vito as an expert witness. Can you answer the question? No. It is a trick question. Why is it a trick question? Watch this. Because Chevy didn't make a 327 in 55. The 327 didn't come out till 62, and it wasn't offered in the Bel Air with a four barrel car till 64. However, in 1964, the correct ignition timing would be four degrees before it top dead center. Well. She's acceptable, Your Honor. Practice performing with a mask. How did you dare to trade and traffic with Macbeth in riddles and affairs of death? And I, the mistress of your charms, the close contriver of all oh, for fuck's sake, I can't breathe under there. And besides which, I look like an ad for NHS dentures. <laughs> 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 I don't see that, that uh, you they just keep on coming, these things. How do you manage to sort of manage yourself through this? Think of all this stuff and maintain the humor when a lot of people are caught. Um, just say again, did you say, how, how do I think think about this? Yeah, how, does, how does this all, I mean, some of it's very current. Um, I know you've got like a whole series that have come out on Facebook that people wait for every day. Um, you clearly well, know people, a lot of people, okay. <laughs> but you know, um, um, it seems to me, maybe you are, maybe there's a whole other side of, co of course that we're not seeing. But a time of, of stress, uncertainty, anxiety, you know, insecurity, and you churning out this very zany, funny, humorous, taking it out on yourself kind of content, almost on a daily basis. Yeah, I like like Drew and and Rowan and and all the people at um, and seen. You know, it it really helps to um, maintain a a kind of schedule, really, I suppose, in a way. And if you're having fun doing it. Um, you know, it does help to keep you insane and learning the lines and getting it down. And I work with a producer, a cart launch a producer friend, uh, Kate Barry, um, who um, you've probably seen lots of her shows on carte launch. 
but she uh, is an amazing talent, very funny lady, writer, producer, and she will <clears throat> phone me up and say, Katie, you know, go and nip downstairs, go down to the, you know, the garage and do, you know, the scene from um, Toy Story with Woody. And, you know, she'll suggest, you know, what I should dicky myself up in. And, and I'll say, no, I can't go down. You know, someone's going to yell at me and tell me to come. She said, oh, please, you know, for God's sake, go down to the basement. No one's going to stop you. And so I end up going up to the boom and trying to film small sections of these, um, these very strange videos that we do. And she puts them together. Um, and I must say, it cheers me up and keeps me sane. So if it does it for anyone else out there, I, I'm, I'm well, glad and grateful. If you haven't checked out Kate's Facebook page, um, you need to friend her very quickly and check them out because they are over the top insane and funny. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, I mean, and they end in, a, in, in, in quite a, we wait for the line at the end. <laughs> my, husband, my husband has become this sort of favorite people write in and sort of say what happened to Saul you know there was no for fuck's sake Saul at the end of today's episode you know they wait yeah, they right. wait before. yeah they all end with for fuck's sake Saul <laughs> <laughs> one of them was uh, for fuck's sake Kate where he kind of swapped roles and I saw that it was funny so Kate that's how you kind of carrying on and going ahead now you just um, refuse to be put down. You making you are in routine. Um, you making. I'm having, to, I'm having to prepare for. You know, I don't know when theatres will open. None of us do, but you know that there is a. You know, there is an idea that smaller gatherings will will kind of happen. So I'm having to put together a, a, um, a project at the moment, which should be um, absorbing my attention. Um, but as soon as we finished. Uh, this interview, I'll, I'll sort of get onto it, um, but um, it's 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 scary because, as you say, there is no insight um, at the moment. Um, the people I'm collaborating with are talking about October, but I think we'll be lucky if if theatres um, commence um, before <clears throat> before the end of the year, and I think that's a hopeful. Um, okay, so, Kate, um, in terms of you, your West End time was very really meaningful to you. you. Still look back on it, um, 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 with joy, and it it propelled you. Came back here, and then started working here with a vengeance. What can you talk about? Something that might have affected you, or might have affected you deeply, that became a challenge, or maybe an obstacle. Um, that you still grapple with, or that you have that you had to get over, to define you as the person that you are. Um, I, I don't, I don't sort of feel anything ab ab above and beyond. The, oh, I'm hearing all sorts of noises. Are you, Dory? Not. I am. I am. Um, I don't think anything beyond the the, the normal kind of um, reinvention um, that that people have to kind of go through. Performers have to go through. Certainly, getting older, um, you you have to um, come come at the industry in a way that is perhaps a bit more creative than when you were younger. Um, I, I'm not classically trained vocally or in the dance, so I kind of have to be the funny guy, um, and you know. Uh, be be a, a, a type so you know uh, in terms of being cast in, in plays or musicals I, I kind of have to can I close my door very quickly because people out there friends of mine will know that the leaf blower is is out here even as I speak and I, I sorry I I can see David Bloch and Brian killing themselves laughing, but the leaf blower is out there, Dory, and I have to close the door. It's distracting to you. Brian, I'm, I think you're trying to tell me that you have an interview that you would like to play, but I'm not sure. Are you? Don't know. <laughs> Okay, Kate, you back. Um, I'm talking about you were you saying that you kind of felt that you had 
you became the funny person and you referred to the fact that you weren't formally trained, but that's never served to hold you back. The diversity of role has been anything from very serious theater to comedy. In fact, you're also known as a comedian of the theater as well. So you've kind of embraced the whole role um, and on purpose. Um, I, you know, I, as, as I say, I, I kind of feel, uh, I, I feel that if, if managements want to use me, I sort of fling myself into, you know, whatever project um, is, is, is facing me with, um, you know, with a fierce kind of focus, but the outcome is never guaranteed. So, you know, you, you have to kind of go into it with um, a strong will and, and belief that you have to, you know, do whatever it is that you need to, to, to make it work. Are you um, in what you take on? Am I, sorry, what, Dori? Are you discerning or will you give it a go? Whatever, um, I think in, in, in the early days, I, I would take everything and, um, you know, certainly, you know, if you have to pay bills, you know, you, you, you will have to take on projects. I think I've probably done two projects in my life that I, I wish I hadn't. But even those um, teach, give you a staying power, a sense of, um, uh, you know, what it, what it is that's required to, to kind of keep you, um, the, the kind of discipline that's required to keep you in a, in a project that, you, you know, your heart's not in. It's sometimes a good exercise, strangely. Can we talk about what those projects were and what, what you would do differently? No. I don't know if I can name them. I, I, I don't want to hurt any managements mm, okay. Get by, it. By, by naming Were them. They projects that because they didn't fit your, that you and them didn't uh, gel well together. I'm really looking at, you know, what you took out of something and that still is with you that you, that, that taught you something in going forward. Yeah. I, th I think you know, if you're involved in a project um, that you don't resonate with, that you feel is a lesser mortal, something that you don't feel is written well or, you know, something that, that, that you don't feel is going to re reflect well. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, if you can commit to it, even within that context, um, and you, you've, you've committed to doing it, there is a um, there is a, a sense of satisfaction that comes from from having seen it to the end and been a trooper and been you know. Um, so you been, kind of, that what you learned is it showed you you showed up no matter what you went through it and you showed up. No, have there been times? I'm sure there must have been because I don't know. I think in almost everybody, not only in your industry, me in my life, quite often, in fact. And in talking to a lot of people, you think to yourself, you know, why am I doing all of this all the time? You know, another time I need to stop, take stock. And then there's the compelling pull of the joy and the meaning that you've been talking about in your industry. But those times where... When it's not easy. Yeah, where it's not easy, maybe sparked by... An event, an in, uh, uh, an issue of uh, something that happened, where you say, "Okay, I love this, but I don't." I I think it sort of it comes in waves in this industry. You know, as a as a kid, you go into it, you're absorbed by it completely. You're one eyed. You know, it, it just it's everything you've ever wanted to do. And then you start hitting walls, you know, the older you get, you know, you perhaps aren't getting the parts that you imagined you should. So you have to reinvent yourself and turn a little corner. Always finding the joy, I suppose. I suppose that's the key because if you, if you lose that, um, that compassion, that sense of what theater is about. I, I, looking at your interview with Janice Honeyman, I was so struck by what she said, and I. She is one of the great teachers I've had in this industry because she is a woman of enormous heart and insight. And she, you know, the, the the important thing for Janice is to communicate 
and to give of yourself. And I think I learned that from Janice is that, you know, you're not doing, you're not in this industry for yourself. I think it maybe perhaps starts off that way, but if there's a, if there's a shift, the older you get, you, you become more attuned to the idea that you're there to, to, to give something back. It's an energy, I suppose, that comes naturally when you're younger, but the older you get, you become more discerning about how you give it out. But it's it, you have to give everything, and that's what Janice, um, I suppose, imparts in all of her productions. Give everything, you know. Go out there and throw your aura to the back of the the theatre and make sure that everybody's having a good time. Mm -hmm. I think when in your performances, I mean, you look at that whole arrange, and you just talk about kind of giving it your all, really, you know, whatever it is. And in some of the uh, writings, you're quite philosophical, actually, contemplative and, and, and thinking about what is it for? What are we doing? You know, kind of what are we offering to humanity? And you have some strong ideas about the raison d'etre of theatre. I know, whether, is, it, is, it, is it reflecting something? I, is it encouraging I, something? Is it entertaining people? What do you think it's about? I don't know if you watched the Met, um, the Metropolitan Opera House, who um, I think they had a live stream two weeks ago. Um, but the, the orchestra was conducted, each of them individually, and, and some of the opera singers, you know, obviously from their homes. But they streamed these, these works, um, and I can't remember it, now a, a lot of the, the titles of the works but it was so moving Dori um, I, I haven't seen a lot of live streaming done you know of, of work that that has been performed individually in a zoom situation I haven't seen a lot of it done successfully but the Met Opera House got it so right recently and it, it moved me to tears and I realized to answer your question that these people have spent years honing their craft um, and, and are giving us something at the moment at this dire time when the, the pandemic is taking lives and, and ruining um, populations. There are these artists out there giving of their time, performing, um, giving, giving us hope, giving us jewels to, to you know, to survive with. <laughs> So, do, and, and do you, is your wish, well, you are, so it clear, clearly is your wish to be part of that. Is it about keeping that alive and that joy and the meaning that comes out of this music? Because the music that you choose, I mean, I think you choose lots of music, but you love music that tells deep stories from what I can gather. You quote Stephen Sondheim. Um, sometimes with that beautiful quote of his that comes out of the song. What was it, Kate? Um, being alive. Somebody, some, somebody, hold me too close. Um, absolutely. I wish I, I wish I had the full lyric with me. Somebody, what is it, Brian? Somebody, hold me too close. Somebody, touch me well, too deep. Have it somewhere. Um, Will because you sent it. It was uh, someone to hold me too close. Someone to hurt me too deep someone to sit in my chair and ruin my sleep and make me aware of being alive. Being alive. Yeah. So and maybe that's what artists can offer, reminding people why they're alive or giving certainly giving them a reason, giving them some hope, some humor, some compassion. I suppose we're the, um, you know, we're the court jesters, Dori. If you can be a court jester and distract everyone from the wars going on around you, just make them happy, make people happy, then you'll have done your job. Hmm. So primarily, I mean, you reflect the world. You say that what you do gives people hope, a kind of belief. It For you, what you're saying is it makes you I think draw inwards and find your own joy and purpose, which you express. You've hit right the nail. You've hit the nail on the head. On all of this, sure. 
And Kate, if you could say to, you started off by talking about the kind of tribe, the, 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 the tribe of people, many of whom have influenced you, but you are now regarded, it sounds funny, I mean, to me it's, you don't want to make it sound in terms of age, you, make, you want to make it sound in terms of respect and experience, which it is, and which you generate, you know, clearly. People, I know the people in the industry are sort of catch their breath and feel in awe of it of you until they get to know you because you do reach out and connect with them, you know, in in the friendly, very, very warm, friendly, engaging manner. And it sounds like you make a point of doing that because you've been there too, you know, yourself. But, you know, when you uh, think of that, um, and, and carrying on with this purpose. What do you see for yourself going forward and, and, and offering? Well, more of the same, I suppose. And um, I think on one of my videos that I sent Brian, um, on one of the introductions, I'd said, Woody Allen once said, busy hands are happy hands. And then I had a little addendum saying that perhaps he wasn't the best example. But I think what he says is right. Busy hands are happy hands. And if you can keep moving, keep writing, keep performing, keep singing, whatever song it is that you are cast to sing, um, keep dancing. We have to keep dancing um, until they tell you to stop. And even then, um, I, I, I'll probably die in harness, you know. Sure. I, I, Kate, yes. is, that, is that the advice? If you were talking to your younger self now, what would you want to say to them, to her, to this little girl who perhaps starry-eyed and starting out? Um, yeah, get your act together. Don't be so cheeky. Get your act together and know that you are loved. Everyone is loved. Well, I think that that's a great way, you know, to close because you are loved. You know, Kate, you are, you loved and you respected and uh, just bring so much joy throughout, you know, all of this and always with showing us about possibility. Because the possibility of diversity and the possibility of just, you know, um, continuing in different ways and reinventing yourself has just been an inspiration and continues to be not only for people who are really in the industry, but I mean, for everybody. So I might just say, please catch those. Faith. I look forward now to those Facebook posts. Um, one day I look forward to meeting you, Saul. <laughs> um, he's got a real job, Nori, so he's busy doing yeah, that. There. But Kate, yeah, he sorry, we honor you, respect you, and all the best with your kitty. Thank you. Thank you so much. And here's to more life giving work, joy, music, and love. More importantly. And most especially love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dari. Thank you so much. And no one ever told us that tomorrow it might not be gone. Some of these replaced with weekend dogs. I don't want to tell.